Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the August edition of The Balanced Perspective. As usual, I am your host, David Levinson of Neg Group Investments, and we are joined on the line by Ian Power, the CIO of Truffle Asset Management. Ian, months go by fast. Thanks again for joining us today. Morning, David, and uh, yeah, good morning to everyone who's signing on on the call. And I guess I need to make a public concession that Ian and I ran our half marathon the other day, and he put daylight between me and him. Uh, he cleaned up. Um, so now you don't have to listen at nauseam as we talk about our, <laughs> our running uh, goals for the rest of the year. But uh, thanks for entertaining us. Um, I did have a few excuses. I was on a two-week trip in Namibia climbing with, climbing with some friends. I then had a chest cold for a couple of weeks. In fact, on the day of the race, I had a chest cold. So uh, my plethora of excuses aside, there's a reason for that. I hedged my bets and I hedged the fact that Ian was going to clean me up on the morning. <laughs> And you did, and uh, I'm looping in some sort of bizarre story here that hedging is the, the topic for today's uh, theme, so I think I, I did all right there. Um, but before we jump into uh, some of the hedging strategies you guys use, Ian, I want to talk a little bit more about some of the more uh, current news. Uh, so last week, Jerome Powell and the Fed upped uh, their rates, I think, by about 75 basis points, targeting that 2.5% uh, level. Um, but he also kind of softened that, saying they're looking to slow the rate of increase. And... Uh, there are a lot of commentary in the market around whether the Fed were behind the curve, um, could have been a little bit more preemptive. Uh, you've spoken about you know, this rate cycle over the last number of quarters, actually. But um, in your view, do you think they've been quite measured in the approach or would you have liked to have seen a little bit more sooner action from them? Uh, David, I think the extent to which they've ratcheted up the size uh, of the hikes probably tells us something about their a concern about the second round effects of inflation becoming embedded in inflation expectations and you know hence I guess the uh, comments about potentially another 75 basis point hike and I think it is fair to say that they were caught napping and uh, you know they should have been slowly applying the brakes for quite some time rather than just leaving it uh, and now having to almost chase down uh, you know what appears to be inflation repressures uh, across almost all sectors uh, and spaces in terms of the market. Um, you know, however, having said that, uh, the speed at which rates have been pushed up is actually quite quite high, or it's, it's quite a lot, and the extent that they've gone up is a lot. So we should expect that this is going to have an effect on the economic momentum, and it probably continues to slow and perhaps slow quite sharply uh, into the back end of the year. And that might give the Fed room to observe the data and get a sense of whether it is still appropriate to continue with the size and frequency of the uh, current moves. Mm. I think that's just it. They're kind of looking to see how hot the economy was cooking once they, they did these, these rates rise and if they needed more action from there. I happened to dial into uh, one of our bigger local asset management. Uh, they kind of had a fireside chat uh, last week, where one of the one of the panelists made made the comment that they expect a Republican incumbent to come into government, which could mean lower rates because Republicans are a little bit more uh, conservative in the economic policy. Uh, but a cornerstone of the Fed has always been its independence. So I don't know if you look much at the politics, if it informs any of your thinking. But I mean, is that not necessarily a correct statement to say that whoever the incumbent is could influence policy? I think, you know, uh, it probably is quite likely that we do see a Republican in power if we just look at uh, approval ratings for Joe Biden and I guess the inflation uh, issues and supply chain consequences which, you know, are sort of falling within his presidency. So uh, the, the issue really is going to be where the U.S. economy is uh, into, um, you know, the next presidential cycle. And chances are that we, they will be cutting rates anyway because, um, you know, we're probably 80% way through the rate hike cycle uh, with the next big move, you know, inevitably going to be a cutting cycle. But I think the big question remains the extent to which inflation, higher inflation expectations have become embedded in uh, pricing in the economy and will the current monetary tightening uh, be sufficient to you know slow that down and i think that's really the big question yeah thanks you know any opportunistic uh, incumbent president will uh, will claim responsibility for business friendly measures if a low rate but that's obviously out of their hands to a large degree um 
Last month, we spoke a little bit about your expectations for company reporting, um, whether it was going to be disappointing or on the upside. Uh, we've had a few names come through last week. So starting on the global side, um, any kind of read through through some of the, the reports that came through? Mm. I think what you sort of would intuitively, intuitively expect to sort of come through, you know, we've had some some weaker than expected numbers from some of the um, the big US uh, social media companies. Um, we've had better than expected numbers from some of the energy companies, the oil companies. And I think, you know, the, the, the slowdown in top line, which we've started to see as a consequence of higher rates uh, and inflation repaying in the system uh, is together with the, the rising costs, logistic costs, fuel costs, um, and raw materials is, is making a, a dent in terms of corporate profitability. So what's interesting is if you look at the, uh, the ACQUI, the World uh, Equity Index, and you strip out uh, energy, what you'll see is already that earnings expectations have rolled over. In other words, there are earnings downgrades and we expect that uh, to continue into the next two, two quarters, certainly from a global perspective. Uh, what is interesting, however, is from an SA context, we're seeing exactly the opposite. We're seeing quite a strong uh, performance from our companies, even those in the discretionary consumer uh, part of the, um, the market. And I think that probably talks to the extent of the benefits that our economies had from the strong resource commodity prices, as well as the uh, social security net uh, in the form of uh, government grants, COVID grants, which have created almost a safety blanket of uh, spend for the low LSN consumer. And we're seeing that in good numbers from ShopRite. Uh, yes, they might be still taking some market share, but the numbers were still good. Pick and pay's numbers were good. We've seen some good numbers from uh, Fashinis. So I think generally, uh, the SA economy is actually looking looking pretty strong uh, with, with, with risks to earnings still being on the upside uh, as opposed to globally where, you know, things are the opposite. Mm. I know on the international side, and you've mentioned this in some of our past webinars, the, your concern around those long duration assets and we're starting to see that play out with some of those tech reportings. And then uh, what a wonderful position to be in to say the South African consumer is <laughs> surprising on the upside uh, relative to some of those global peers. So you have hold, I think, well, you mentioned ShopRite. I don't know if that's in the fund, but you do hold Spa, Pick and Pay, uh, Woolworths, and you can kind of, can you extrapolate what's happening with ShopRite to some of those names as well? I think so. And I think we've sort of seen that in a, in a consumer which is uh, a little bit more resilient, notwithstanding what some of the, the pressures that, they, that they're facing. Uh, and I think also SA businesses generally are quite resilient and resourceful. And many of the big corporates have managed to weather the storm of uh, COVID as well as some of the power interruptions and uh, are, are you know, posting some pretty decent earnings updates on what are quite low uh, by historical standards valuations for a lot of these businesses. And, you know, that that's not even talking about the potential benefit if we see the uh, impact of the deregulation of the power generation side, which uh, the president sort of spoke to in terms of lifting licenses and lifting the caps on the 100 megawatts, uh, as well as, uh, you know, additional renewable, this could inject a much needed dose of uh, infrastructure spending and loans on banks balance sheets into SA Inc. And, uh, you know, that that could have some pretty positive consequences for uh, SA businesses which are lean and mean uh, and certainly not expensive by historic standards. Mm. It's interesting you mentioned that. I mean, in our discussions with our CIB colleagues, it's the same thing. They're, they're just so hungry for business in the green energy space. And as those feed-in tariffs and the, the generation capacity start to increase, uh, for the greenies out there, fingers crossed that we see that happen uh, sooner than later. In fact, not just the greenies, anybody's interested in South Africa's power generation uh, for that matter. Um, another interesting one has actually been, and I, I don't need an answer from you on this, was just the banks. I mean, because part of Nedbank, we obviously follow the share price quite closely. Um, if I rewind a year uh, ago, you know, it was down to, in the meat of COVID, 70, 80 rand a share. I think it was trading, last I looked, over 200, 215, 220, somewhere around there. So they're benefiting, obviously, from what you mentioned in terms of a relatively healthy consumer, but also the, the rate cycle that we're currently in. So uh, always a nice proxy for me to look at as well as some of the local retailers. And 
finally, I'm going <laughs> I'm to get to the, the topic of today. So um, it is around hedging and the fund has had some positions put in calls on uh, the Aussie, SWIX, um, the SMP offshore. And I know that Saul Miller is your kind of numbers guy in the background, but when I discovered that Ian Sun represented South Africa at uh, the Maths Olympiad, I knew I can safely go down this derivative journey with him. So um, in the fund, in fact, the balance fund, as well as the managed, I think got two of six funds in the multi-asset high equity category. I don't know if you knew this, um, to be in positive territory for the first six months of this year, which is quite stunning in itself. But how, what role have those options played um, in some of the performance numbers and maybe kind of buffering some of those figures? Yeah. So, David, I think that's right. And I think, you know, when we are seeking to deliver the sort of real returns uh, that our clients need uh, for their long-term liabilities, you know, I think our fund has managed to do real eight uh, for over a decade. Um, part of being able to deliver that actually doesn't come from just finding the winners and these uh, stocks that really do well and outperform, but it also comes from making sure that when risks are rising, and in fact, those tail risks, uh, uh, the probability of those things manifesting goes up, is to be defensive and to play defensive, and particularly when you can buy cheap insurance. So what we've tended to do well is uh, protect capital, uh, during times when when those risks are accelerating and when we can see that perhaps, um, you know, some of the pricing of uh, the securities is not reflecting perhaps uh, some of the risks that we think, uh, you know, there's a high probability of seeing those things. So typically what we've done is we've had hedging strategies where, for example, one of the big ones we've had this year is we've had a, a collar around the S&P uh, 500 against our basket of global, you know, value energy based type, type companies. So that's really worked out well where the S&P is down, I think at one point it was almost down 20%. Uh, and, you know, many of the shares that we've held, those higher yielding shares, which are less affected by rising rates have actually done quite well. So I think what that does is it creates a ability to protect capital um, when you're getting this negative beta, which puts you in such a good position that when ultimately, you know, we get uh, economic growth and things stabilize, uh, that you can then get the benefit of the higher beta plus the plus the, the alpha that we think we can put on top of that. So, you know, I think the return is really a function of two things. One is making sure that we protect capital when those risks are high and and be defensive and have you know proper hedging and strategies in place and then secondly try and capture that upside uh, in addition to some of the alpha via our stock picking ideas so i think our two principal hedges have been the collars on the s p uh, secondly we've also we also had some some collars on the uh, swix and the jse because we were concerned of a correlation flow through uh, which which we saw uh, and we've subsequently taken, you know, probably 50% of those hedges off. They've really paid off nicely. And we also benefited from uh, taking a big portion of the fund's assets offshore uh, because it's a much cheaper way of hedging because the RAND typically blows out during periods of uh, dislocation or risk. And that can also benefit you, uh, you know, uh, uh, as, a, as a cheaper way of uh, um, achieving some sort of portfolio protection. And I mean, that, that really has resulted in us being able to protect capital uh, into this first uh, seven months of the year, which has been, you know, quite a, quite a challenge. Fantastic. I'm just looking at the clock here. It's staring at me one minute. So we, we pretty much on time this week. We usually do creep over. So, uh, but yeah, thanks as always for your comments today, Ian. And uh, we'll catch up with you in a month's time. Great, David. And thanks to everyone who joined us today. And just to, as I usually do, I wasn't typing away as normal, so I'm a little bit behind the curve, just like Ian said, the Fed were in terms of upping their rates. So they were a little bit late to the party. Um, interestingly, I think they're going to take a stance that kind of looks at how current policy is affecting the the heat or the, the, uh, of the economy there before they make any more um, assumptions beyond the next 75 basis points that they've highlighted. Um, locally, Ian said that ShopRite pick and pay earnings were pretty decent. Uh, so maybe a read through there for the state of the SA consumer. Ian also mentioned the, the grants that have obviously been continued to be delivered um, throughout COVID and post that. Um, 
Also, on the positive side, the announcement around particularly green energy and upping that capacity in terms of solar generation and how they, those can, can fit or at least feed in back into the grid. Um, and then on the topic for today in terms of options, um, I think what really came through in Ian's answer there was around the protectionist mindset, so not losing clients' capital and those that have been in the fund would be aware in terms of the performance side of the balance fund. So um, do please do join us in two days' time um, on Thursday where my colleague Neil Jagmahan is turned to, I believe, Anthony Burgess of Veritas on uh, inflation and as well as Veritas's view on the healthcare um, sector. So from myself and Ian, thank you very much for joining us today and we will catch up with you soon. Take care.